Blog Talk Radio. And good evening, everybody, and thank you for choosing King Jordan Radio. The date is December 4th. 2014, and tonight we're going to go over Bill Cosby and the allegations uh, with Bill Cosby. We'll go over the grand jury's decision not to charge in either New York or Ferguson, and we'll touch on Adrian Peterson. Let's welcome back to the show. She is a a wonderful prosecutor out of Florida. Uh, She was on CNN the other day. She has two books. Her name is Stacey Honowitz, and she joins us now. Good evening, Stacey. How are you? And welcome back to King Jordan Radio. Hi, Jordan. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. And we've had a pretty interesting week in the legal news, so I guess we should hit on on all the headlines that made it into the news this week. And uh, in your field, there was plenty, but I just want to say, how was your Thanksgiving? Was it good? Very nice. Thank you very much for asking. It was lovely. Okay. The Bill Cosby situation, I want to get into that because I know you do sex crimes and you you have two books out right now, which is called Genius with a Penis is one. And what's the other one? My Privates are Private. Right. And that's available on the Internet, of course. And uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, two great books. Um, so check it out. But I want to start with uh, Bill Cosby. The first question I want to ask you, as a prosecutor, now that we see over twenty uh, alleged victims coming out, how do you know who's telling the truth? In other words, how do you know if one is not just might have been in the same situation and is playing copycat to possibly? do whatever, get money, or how do you know if, uh, which is truthful and which is not? I mean, they all can be truthful, but how do you distinguish that as a prosecutor? Well, listen, as a prosecutor, we learn and we know from doing so many cases, although you never always know everything, whether or not somebody is just copying the facts of what somebody else said. But it's very common, Jordan, in these cases for women who have been keeping this type of secret you know, for lack of a better term, for the last 20 years, to come forward when they hear somebody else. And what you have to do in order to really vet these victims is to find out if, in fact, there would be a time when they would even have contact with Bill Cosby. In other words, sometimes when you have copycat cases, when women come forward in order to get money, you come to find out after a thorough investigation that there would have never even been an opportunity for them to be near the person that they're claiming raped them. In this case, what we're beginning to see is that all of these women, at some time or another, had the ability to have contact with Bill Cosby. Either they were surrounded right. by him socially or work-wise, or as the bodyguard came forward and said, he was instructed to bring certain girls over from a modeling agency. So when we start to see a pattern and we were able to compare and contrast different stories, we are then able to make a real determination as to whether or not some women are just coming forward for the sake of it. They just really were too nervous and too scared and felt threatened and intimidated to come forward for a long time. Now, what you're seeing in these cases is prior to Gloria Allred having a press conference today, nobody really was asking for money. Nobody really wanted the fame. Nobody said they were writing a book. They really just came right. forward because once they heard the first allegation, the woman in Philadelphia came forward then they decided that it was time to tell their story because in these types of cases, because you're dealing with a public figure such as Bill Crosby, who's so beloved by the public and had such a reputation, the idea of going against him and being intimidated and having to tell the public really is one of those things where you just say, I'm I'm just not going to say anything, I'm going to live with it. In this case, now we're starting to see that there really is strength in numbers. Somebody came forward, somebody's not afraid, and now I'm not afraid. So you're going to see more cases. I'm telling you that that, that women, um, if in fact he has been around all these women, if he has a a predilection for that type of behavior, 
uh, I'm sure you're going to see more women come forward in the next coming weeks. What is your opinion on the wife? Is she in denial or is she just playing along with Bill Cosby, just maybe making herself believe it's not true? Well, I think it's so, I think you see so much of this behavior when there's a wife or a significant other and somebody's accused of sexual abuse. In Sandusky, we saw his wife, who pretty much was in full denial, and look at all the allegations that were against her. Right. She was interviewed. She was in denial. She didn't want to believe it. And I think that's really the type of behavior that they're experiencing. Even if they're not in denial, they just don't want to believe that it actually could be the person that they're with. So, you know, I don't know how she sits idly by and doesn't think to herself, can this be true? How can all of these women, all of these women be making right. something up? So I, and, you know, it could also be a matter of one of those deals where she just says, I've been with him for so long, and this was in the past, and I'm just going to kind of forget about it, and it, it was then, and it's not now, and he's the father of my children, and I'm going to stay. So this type of behavior by a significant other is stuff that we see all the time. We even see situations where the significant other just really wants to back the person and says, listen, it's it virtually impossible. I believe everything he has to say. So I'm not a psychologist. I don't know what goes into their thought process. The only thing I can tell you is her behavior is quite common. My, most people might say, what are you talking about? But because I'm in the throes of this every single day, this is exactly the type of behavior that we see on a daily basis. They come to court. They don't want to believe it. They sit there. They tell. They call these women liars. I mean, they're they're there to support their husband or significant other, and and how they choose to handle it is is really their business. But lots of times, it doesn't result in a divorce or a separation, especially when there's kids involved. You know, I had Richard Herman on about two weeks ago, and he has a totally different opinion. He said that they're all pathetic. He said this is a money grub. He said they should have went to the police uh, as soon as the as soon as possible. And he thinks this is a modern uh, lyn uh, lynching job. There are people that have this thought. Maybe they're in denial because they like Bill Cosby, or maybe, you know, he's just playing defense. Um, I happen to believe these accusers, in my opinion. But what do you what do you say when you hear something like... Well, I mean, I've known Rich for a long time, and that's what he's doing. He is a defense lawyer. And, you know, every time you go into a case where you have a delayed report, even if it's a delayed report of two weeks, the defense always says to the, to the to the victim, why didn't you go forward? Why did you wait? Why didn't you say anything? People have absolutely no idea what is goes on in a rape prosecution. I mean, you have to imagine, you, we know how many rape victims never come forward when it's a stranger that does this to them, to them because of the intimidation factor, of the embarrassment of having to talk about private parts. People just think that you go into a courtroom and you say, this person raped me. In a rape prosecution, that person has to take the stand and t tell a, a jury and strangers and the public about the most intimate, delicate uh, details of what happened. You can't just say he raped me. You have to go into detail as to what happened. You have to talk about body parts and what happened, all these things. So you have that with a stranger. Imagine going up against somebody that the world loves, that is on television, that's a big celebrity, that basically plays, everybody knows, and the intimidation and the factor. Character because I'm sure that he plays, the character that he plays is Mr. L uh, Captain America. Like the, the old mighty Bill Cosby would never be capable of Dr. Huxtable doing such heinous things. That's exactly I think right. A lot of people, people, they, that's exactly right. And people, you know, don't want to believe. I mean, listen to all the the feedback that, that these women are getting now, and people saying they're liars, whatever. So you're dealing with people that were so unbelievably intimidated that had this feeling, how can I go forward? I'm probably disgusted with people who said, you can't do it, you can't go forward, you're never going to win, no one's ever going to believe you. So, you know, the idea that people wait to report rapes is so common. This behavior, anybody will tell you in any rape cases, this behavior is so common. I mean, we have kids that were raped as children that don't come forward. I go to the grand jury in cases. They don't go forward until 30 years later because that's the first time that they feel like they can actually talk and someone might believe them. So what Richard says, he's, he's certainly, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Everybody is going to have an opinion. But I um, just want to tell the, your, your listeners that the behavior that they've exhibited is extremely common. And a rape prosecution is probably one of the hardest prosecutions that anybody could uh, have to go through because the bottom line is 
it's not going to happen in front of 10 people. It's one of the most discreet crimes that you have. So, I mean, that's what, and, and just the idea that we're bringing up, that's what they're up against. They're up against people challenging their veracity. How could this be possible? I think another issue that we have to, you know, if you don't mind me going into, is people, no, when they hear the term rape, have a very different idea, have a very different idea of what rape is. In other words, they see movies and they see strangers jumping out of the woods, abducting right. people off the sidewalk and violently throwing them down and then having forceful sex with them. Rape under the law is just non-consensual sex. So in this case, they knew him, they knew who he was, but the idea that they wanted to have sex with him is why it's called rape, because they said, I didn't want to. He drugged me, and when I came to, this is what was going on. So the idea that you have a celebrity whose reputation is, you know, unfathomable, and the idea that he didn't violently beat up these women and jump on them, that's what people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. So I think that's, that's what's the difficulty in, in seeing these cases come to light now. Uh, absolutely. Um, okay, let me put you in a hypothetical situation. Let's say we are in the, st- the statue where a, a guy like Bill Cosby, they bring that to your office, and we're within the time range. Are you going to prosecute that case? Well, that's that's really a loaded question, and I'll tell you why. I don't have all the facts in front of me, and um, Bruce Castro, who was the prosecutor uh, in Philadelphia at the time that the first girl came forward, felt very strongly that something had happened but had one witness and didn't have a lot of evidence. So whether or not I subjectively believe it is different than whether or not I can take it into court because I can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, and and that's the difference. Certainly if I had one person that came forward years later and I didn't have anything other than her testimony, it might be very difficult for me because it's her word against his and there's nothing to back it up unless she had a diary entry somewhere, unless she told someone at the time that it happened and she didn't want to go forward, unless she documented and there was medical evidence and the medical and she just decided not to prosecute. But I've had cases like this. I had a case, very interestingly enough, where I had one male victim who had gone into a doctor's office and claimed that he was molested not under anesthesia. So we had one, one male versus a very prominent doctor. And so we had to look at it that way. And at that point, we didn't feel like we, there was no reason for us not to believe him, but as far as having evidence to go into court, we had a problem. So what happened was we put a press release out. The cops put a press release out. And believe it or not, seven other men came forward with no motivation, with no reason to report such a horrific crime and have to tell people details of what went on And once we had other people and the story started to match up, we went forward. So to put it in a situation that somebody comes forward 20 years later, one person, it would be very difficult to go forward. But if I had more than one person and the story started to match up, there wouldn't be any reason for me not to. So in other words, even if you have an inkling and you're you're 95% sure, if you can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, you don't take it, right? Correct. I have to have Absolutely. a reasonable likelihood of conviction. That, that's what the standard is, a reasonable likelihood of conviction. And if you have one witness from 20 years ago who delayed the report and didn't come forward and all we had was her word, then the likelihood of conviction would not be there, and so we probably wouldn't go forward. Not to say, again, that it didn't happen, just to say that I didn't have enough to take it into a courtroom. And that's the difference. Okay, I want to talk about the two no indictments. Uh, first, from Eric Gardner and... Um uh, Mike Brown, but I want to play this clip so the, my audience knows what's going on with this story. And then we'll talk on the other side. Okay, so the breaking news for the moment is that the officer accused in the chokehold death of Eric Garner in New York City is not going to be indicted by a grand jury. The decision has already been made. This is just a couple minutes ago. And if you're feeling deja vu all over again, of course, this has uh, some of the similar underpinnings of the situation in Ferguson with Officer Darren Wilson and Mike Brown. And Darren Wilson obviously walked. He has since resigned from the police department, but uh, the protests are still ongoing, and obviously we haven't heard the last of that. And then to then put this New York situation, you know, it's interesting. I've only, this literally happened about 10 minutes ago from when we're taping this. 
And just on a quick scroll of Twitter, I'm seeing something that you almost never see anymore, which is actually bipartisan. I'm seeing people on the left and people on the right. I'm seeing liberals and conservatives all kind of going, ah, maybe we didn't agree on the Ferguson one. Maybe some of the facts we didn't all agree on or the eyewitness testimony of or what happened with Mike Brown and Officer Wilson. But this one seems a lot more straightforward. Uh, the chokehold, there's obviously video of it. The arrests, which was maybe for selling illegal cigarettes or something. There's a lot of people saying that these are different cases, that even the people, uh, mostly on the right, who are saying that uh, Darren Wilson getting off and not being indicted in that case was okay. There's more people already, again, this is only in a couple of minutes, that are already saying that something is not right here. Uh, you know, they say bad things happen in threes. So we just had, regardless of whether you think Darren Wilson should have been indicted or not, something, uh, an innocent person died, you know what I mean? Or, or someone that should not have died, even if he had done something criminal, someone that should not have been murdered, died. Now we have it again, just, you know, two weeks after or a week and a half after the decision on that one. Uh, and, you know, these are the types of things, uh, as I said, they say things happen in threes. Like, we have one more of these things. We're starting to get to critical mass with this. Uh, you know, a lot of people wanted to believe that we were post-racial after Obama uh, was elected. Uh, obviously, that's not the case. I don't know that that ever is really the case ever, anywhere. Um, people have old, old hatreds. People, you know, things don't change as quickly. They change quick often, but not as quickly as like. Anyway, so this story just broke. I hope, again, calmer heads will prevail and that everyone's going to uh, be okay and we'll, we'll wait out to see Okay, Stacey Honowitz, when you hear about the uh, grand jury and uh, Colt uh, um, and Ferguson, especially all these riots, uh, what's your take on um, the recent uh, no charges to Officer Darren Wilson and now yesterday to uh, the officer in New York City? Well, it is quite interesting that... Both of these cases, both of these grand juries chose not to indict within two weeks of one another. And I have to tell you that the cases are significantly different. In Ferguson, you have basically the forensic evidence and the conflicting witness testimony that really was the reason I believe that the grand jury didn't indict. You know, the grand jury, grand juries are supposed to be very secretive and it's supposed to be um, really within their discretion. And usually the grand jury testimony is never given out. And I think in this case, and it really preserves the integrity of the grand jury because no one right. should be second-guessing what you do. And in this case, in Ferguson, they let the grand jury testimony, they released all of the information and all the evidence because they wanted the public to see just what they were up against and what the grand, juries were, what the grand jury was de debating on. Now, many people say that, listen, a prosecutor goes into the grand jury and they have one standard, and that is just to show probable cause that a crime existed. And what happens is the prosecutor lays out basically the case and what crimes could be charged. In Ferguson, there was a big debate as to whether or not the prosecutors really kind of tried the case and presented so much, and especially with Wilson testifying for four hours, which is their right, they have every right to testify without a lawyer present, that they had such conflicting testimony that the witness statements really did not match up at all with what the forensic physical evidence is. And the physical evidence isn't ever going to change. It is what it is. In this case, and so that's why the grand jury came back the way it did. In this case, we have a very unusual situation because we have a videotape of what transpired. Now, it's my understanding and reading a lot of what went on is that although the medical examiner ruled it to be a homicide, he ruled it to be with contributing factors. Was the chokehold the actual reason that this individual died, this horrible situation? And because I'm just surmising, they found it to be that it wasn't the only factor which caused his death. They basically said that this officer was justified in using the force that he did. And that's what you have to look at. What are they justified in using? Was it excessive force? Now, the, the reason why you're having all of these protests is because when you see that videotape and you see that chokehold, you believe it's excessive force. They didn't need to use that. And that's why the feds are now going to investigate, even though even though there was not a return, it was a no true bill, which basically means there's no indictment the feds still have an opportunity to look at it and to file federal criminal charges against him under 
uh, the U.S. You, you know, the U.S. Code and the federal statute, and that's what they're going to do now. That came out tonight that Eric Holder is going to conduct a federal investigation to see whether or not the person's civil rights, the uh, Gardner's civil rights, were violated. And you, you, you do then have still of a problem because there was no probable cause finding, and now you have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. But the, but the evidence is, although it's substantially the same. They're going to see different things that the grand jury didn't say. So I think in this case, you know, we, we have to. I'm glad that everything's been pretty peaceful this far in New York. We haven't seen the outburst that right. we saw in Ferguson. But I think that we need to really start looking at these things. And I think the grand jury testimony is going to be released in this case, too, so they can see why the grand jurors voted the way in which they did. And so it's two different stories. In one case, we got to see, actually, the videotape. In the other one, we had conflicting evidence. So we have to ask, they have to ask themselves, were, was this police officer justified in using the force he did? Now, the, the other issue that arises in this case is the chokehold that was used has been deemed to be illegal under their policy. So that's another thing. Yes. Was that presented? Was that presented to the grand jury? Were they aware of the fact if she's not allowed to use that hold, again, I think it goes back to the to although it was ruled a homicide, I think that the jurors had a difficult time because I don't know if they believe that that was the factor that caused the person's death. Now, again, there were different things that you could be indicted for. Certainly, we don't believe that he intentionally tried to kill this individual. But as a result of his actions, this person died. So there's negligence. Is it negligent homicide? I mean, that's what people are asking. I don't think anybody thought that taking this person down, he sought to kill him. But as a result of right. his actions, number one, they were the actions of the police officer. Number two, were they excessive? And as a result of the excessive, you know, do, was it excessive? That's another question. And the third question to answer is, if it was excessive, what do you believe the crime is? And that's negligent homicide. And that's everything that the feds are going to look into now to see if there's a case. There's also, there could be a wrongful death case on the part of the parent, the wife, and there can also be, there's a couple of cases that could come out of this. There's the federal criminal case, there's the federal civil case under a 1983 claim, a deprivation of, of civil rights, and then there's the wrongful death suit. So we certainly have not heard the end of this, but I just hope that it remains peaceful, and I hope people realize that there's good and bad in every occupation. There's good cops and there's bad cops, and just because we in the last who've been inundated with it in the last month, um, people have to realize that there are some really good police officers out there, too. So I'm hoping that it remains calm, and then we let the feds move on from here. With respect with the Eric Gardner case, um, if this was not a cop, do you think he'd be indicted? If this was what? I'm sorry? If this a guy who uh, killed Eric Gardner with the chokehold was not a cop, Daniel Kuna, uh, if he was a regular civilian, is there any way that he's not indicted? Oh, you know, listen, that's such, that's such a difficult question. I mean, I think what you're trying to get at, is it difficult for cops to be indicted? And I think people right. might say that it is because people generally think that the police officers are doing their job and if you disobey them, and they have a right to take you down. And that's what they were saying. He had a right to take him down because it appeared as though he was resisting. He kept saying, you know, what did I do? I mean, there's so I, – I hate to hone in because I don't have the testimony in front of me. And, and it's such speculation. But I think in general right. people think that they're police officers. I think that the common, the common feeling among people is police officers won't ever get indicted, and especially because it's the prosecutors that have a tight relationship with police officers. Um and that's a hard question. You know, I'm a prosecutor. I've gone to the grand jury. I haven't gone to the grand jury against a police officer. But, you know, there, like I said, I've had, as even as a prosecutor, um, when I saw a police officer, I thought was doing something improper. It didn't go unnoticed. It wasn't just swept under the carpet because I'm a prosecutor and we work hand in hand. Um, but I think, I think what they're getting at is do people feel as though the police are treated differently? I think people do have that, that feeling, especially when they saw these two results within the last month. Yes, and you said there were two different cases. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, 
what you we're think dealing one with here is, than the like other? I said, what I think what we talked about is we're talking about two. They're, listen, when in some substance they're the same because two people died at the at, at the hands of two police officers. So there's right. therein lies the similarity that it's two unarmed black men who died at the hands of two white police officers, and that that's really where the that, that's really the similarity that's there. The difference that you have is in Ferguson, we had testimony, conflicting testimony of witnesses that changed their story. First they said he was charging, then when when it was investigated later on, they found out that the witness lied about something. You had definite conflicting testimony. And what you didn't have in Ferguson, although you had the testimony that was conflicting, you didn't have a tape of it. And that's what Obama was trying to bring out now. Now he wants the cops to wear cameras on their vests because he wants to be able to see, just like in, in, in a, a lot of arrests now where they have the um, cameras in the back of the car, we want to be able to see how much the person resisted to let us know how much force you could actually use. That was Ferguson. That's what came out of Ferguson. This case was different because you did have a first-hand view of what happened. You had a tape. Well, you normally, in any kind of process, we wish all the time things were on videotape. When you try a robbery case, you pray that the security camera works in the place you could see the person. In this case, you actually had an individual that had a copy of the tape. And so you ask yourself, what is it that they didn't see that we saw? Well, he also testified in his case, this police officer, for two hours in front of the grand jury. I don't know what the questions that were posed. I don't know what he said other than he believed that I gather that he uh, didn't intend to kill him and that what he did was he was taking him down and he died as a result of him taking him down. So, uh, you know, this is, these are all the things, like I said, that we don't know because we don't have the testimony. I do believe that they said they're going to release this too. So once that comes in, I think that the answer is to whether or not his force was excessive according to what his feeling was. Um, you know, we'll have to see what he said in front of the grand jury. He's, of course, expressed his condolences now and said that he wishes and he wished it didn't turn out the way it was. But, you know, as they say, it's a day late and a dollar short, you know. You you, you have, and that's why I said it, it's the, the irony of these two cases landing in the public view within the last month is astonishing. It really is. Because there are grand juries that meet every single day and believe me, there's plenty of police officers that are brought in front of the grand jury, and these happen to be high profile, and everybody gets to hear about it now. Uh, no question about it. The other topic uh, that I wanted to talk to you, our final topic of the evening, um, you deal with child abuse, and this is uh, different. It's not sexual abuse. It's physical abuse, and uh, Adrian Peterson doesn't spend one day in jail. He beat the heck out of his kid with a switchboard, and uh, I'm sure you know the rest of uh, when, when he did. He suspended the whole year. What's your take on uh, Adrian Peterson, Minnesota Vikings? Well, listen, we, I, we do the physical cases, too. And, it's, it's, you know, the interesting part about physical abuse is it's, the line is drawn again once more when we talk about excessive force. The law allows parental corporal punishment. It's allowed. People will say... You can discipline your child. The question then becomes, is the discipline too excessive? If you have a four-year-old child who does something improper, is it proper to beat him and leave marks on him, or is that deemed to be excessive? And that's what we look at every single day. I didn't see the photographs in this case. It's my belief that they were pretty bad. About him not spending a day in, well, prosecutors probably figured that they weren't going to be able to get the, the child in to testify, and that's what you need. Sometimes right. you have to have the child there. You can't just use the picture. The child has to identify what happened to them, who did it to them, all those kinds of things. And so in what lieu of having this? to have the child testify, they work out a plea deal. And in this case, it took a long time. I don't even remember, quite frankly, how it came to their attention, Um who reported it or how it, I don't know if somebody saw the bruises on the child or what happened, but you know, this is another daily occurrence. Like, it always takes a big high-profile case for people to see that this type of behavior with parents goes on all the time. We don't, you know, like it, 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 it's a standard line that everyone says, you need a license to, to go fishing and to catch lobsters and whatever, and you don't need a license 
to parent a child, and people are unaware. People don't know, and lots of people don't care, and they don't think they're ever going to get in trouble because they do take the attitude, it's my kid, and I'm going to do what I want. What about, you know, oh, this is how they were brought up 30, 40 years ago, and uh, he even says this is how I was brought up, Adrian Peterson. What about this idea of them using that excuse, or maybe it's reality, actually, that uh, in that in that time, that's how they, uh, you know, discipline their children. From well, guess people. What? what? When a judge reads a jury instruction to a jury, there is no place in the jury instruction that says, and ladies and gentlemen, you can vindicate or find the defendant not guilty because that's the way he was brought up. That's a lame excuse, and it's never going to fly in court because... Sometimes you got to learn that how you were brought up was improper. And you have to learn that you right. have to live by the rules and the laws that we have now. So to say that's how you were brought up, well, you know what? It could be grounds to mitigate and not send you to prison for a long time, but it doesn't negate the guilt of the person because everybody could rely on that excuse. Can you imagine being able to use that excuse? Anybody walking into court and saying, that's how I'm brought up. That's all I know. So it's never going to work. And that's, that's we see it in sex abuse cases all the time certain cultures who believe that it's okay to have sex with kids, they come into this country and they say, well, that's how I was brought up. Well, guess what? It's not a defense. It's not a legal defense in the, in the United States. And you open a floodgate of, litig- of, of defense of people walking in and saying, hey, that's how I was brought up. Yeah, you can't use that excuse, but it seems to be uh, happening uh, with a lot of people. That's what they say. I mean, yeah. it obviously I mean, you're going to see it. You're going to try it. You're going to see it. You're going to see a lot of, look, a lot of things are coming to light now. The Ray Rice situation, the violence in the NFL, all of these things have been transpired forever. They've just never come to light. People were always scared to talk about child abuse and domestic violence and physical abuse and sexual abuse. Now, because it's become so mainstream, people aren't afraid to speak up, and that's why we're seeing so many more cases. Not only that, but so many states have changed the law that if you're aware that someone's been physically abused, you have a mandatory duty to report that. So if a kid goes to school with bruises or a neighbor sees it or whatever, if you don't report it, you yourself can be charged with a crime. So that's why we're seeing all these things coming to light now. Yes, yes, yes. In a lot of ways, it's it's very true. And have you had to prosecute a lot of cases with the, uh, like Adrian Peterson where there was uh, child abuse where – kid was in danger like that? I do it every day of the week. Every single day of the week I have cases where a parent has beat the you-know-what out of their kid. And a teacher has come forward, and lots of times, even like in sexual abuse cases, a child is not going to come forward so easily and say, my mom or my father beat me up. They're afraid of retaliation. They're afraid of leaving the house. Sometimes that's all they know. They only know about being in, abuse, in an abusive household. It's right. our job as prosecutors to make sure that they're not in that because then you hear the next day about how the departments haven't removed a child from a home and you know what happens. You know how that kid eventually ends up. So parents better realize that their feeling about discipline is going to change a lot if their kid goes to class or goes to school and they have bruises all over their body because it's not going to fly, but that's how I discipline my kid. We have laws, and we've all, none of us has the right to violate rules that we all share, and that's specifically in the jury instructions. Whenever a judge is talking to a jury and there's a defendant in the courtroom, none of us have the rules, the right to violate rules that we all share. Absolutely. And um, is there one case that you have done that you're, that you're really proud of, like maybe a real, a real serial uh, rapist that you put away? Is there one that sticks out to you in, in your career? Yeah, well, I've been doing this for a very long time, 28 years. But one case that really sticks out is I prosecuted, well, the one that I talked about earlier was a physician who was mm-hmm. molesting his male patients not under anesthesia. And that was a pretty tough case because this guy had some resume and you would think to yourself, why would somebody do something like this? But he did. Um, the other one is 
a case where I prosecuted a volunteer at an autistic school. He volunteered at two schools and was molesting autistic young children, which is just awful because so many of the autistic kids couldn't speak for themselves. And he fled, and we found him in the Philippines, and we brought him back, and we were able to prosecute, and he went to prison. And so, you know, cases like that are rewarding, unbelievable cases because any any kid case is going to, you know, carry such importance with it. But it's rewarding when you when you have a case and these children have been hurt for so long and you're able to put a stop to it. You know, and then when I ha- I have cases where I have victims from 18 years ago that were really children back then that call me now and, and thank me for, you know, saving them out of a physical physical harm or sexual harm. They've been abused by an adult, sexually abused for a long time. So, you know, it's it's extremely, although it's, very depressing what I do because I see really the worst of the worst in everyday life, right. especially with kids. It's extremely rewarding when you know that you've done something to really help them. Uh, no question. And uh, they need a voice, these kids. And I'm sure that gives you great satisfaction putting these uh, bad criminals away. Well, but, uh, and that's, anyway, why the, thank that's you. the reason why I, I wrote the books, because so many kids were having such a difficult time yeah, talking about, about it. About it was books. going on, and, and they could never talk about it. it parents really never Tell us about the books, it. and uh, tell, tell my audience about the books, uh, about it, and how they could get it. Well, I wrote the books specifically because I had so many cases where I had kids come into my office, and it was a delayed report, just like these women... I mean, it's like it's, it goes in cycles. These kids sometimes don't report right away. Lots of them don't because they're threatened, they're intimidated, they're scared, the whole nine yards. And so I wrote the books because I wanted them to be able to feel like they could talk about it, they could report it. Even if they felt like they couldn't go to their mother, they could go to a neighbor, a friend, a school person, and to know that someone was going to stand up for them. So many parents would tell me that, they did not know how to really have a discussion with their kids about touching, good touching, bad touching, and what to do. And so when I had those two ideas together, I thought I really need to do something so that parents and kids could really have an open discussion about a really delicate subject and make it really easy and comfortable. And so these books, while they're, I always say they're small books with a huge message, they've helped so many kids be able to really express themselves. The books are written in limerick form. They're easy with cute characters. It's nothing technical. It's not instructional. It's just a fun little book about what to do if, God forbid, anybody ever touches you. So I wrote the book. My my greatest joy would be to be able to get these into schools because now in a lot of the schools, it's going to be mandatory that sex education is taught on an elementary school level. So really that's what I'm striving for, to try to get the books more mainstream. Everybody that originally heard the idea said to me, and this is way before sexual abuse became so prevalent in in in, in uh, the media, you can't have right. something like this. It's just too difficult. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear about private parts. Nobody cares. And now, believe it or not, because we are seeing so much of this every single day, every single time you open the newspaper, put on the news, you hear about sexual predators and sex crimes and teachers having sex with students and little kids being abused and and child porn. Now, I think people are starting to realize we do need to educate. We do have to be able to have some way to teach kids that it's not okay and to tell. So the books are available I lecture in a lot of schools. I lecture all over in all the kinds of groups. And I really lecture a lot to parents because so many of them told me that they don't know how to start a discussion. So they're available on my website, stacyhonowitz.com. They're available on Amazon. They're available on Barnes & Noble. And um, for those parents out there that don't know really how to start a conversation or feel funny or embarrassed or uncomfortable, buy the book because you'll see how easy it is. And it's something that... These books don't go, they're not like diet books that go out of style when a new diet comes along (laughs) or a new fad comes along because sexual abuse, everyone thinks that it's going to go away. It's just, it's never going to get away. It's only going to get worse with the internet and child porn and all that kind of stuff. 
sexual abuse is going to be around for a long does, time. Does so that, that help you books. prosecute the the social media? Does that did that ever help you prosecute? Uh, maybe yeah, social media has been a big factor. Social media has been a big factor in prosecutions. Um, you know, Facebook and things like that. We can see what's posted, what's there, what's tweeted. Um, all porn cases certainly are a lot easier because we actually have the documentation as opposed to having, you know, a four- or five-year-old child take the stand and talk about it. You actually have it on film. As disgusting and horrific as it is, it's our biggest piece of evidence that, that helps us in putting these people away. A lot of the cases now, believe it or not, are really focused on, I, I don't know why it's become so in vogue for a young female teacher to have sex with their male students. Now, yes. the interesting thing about that yeah, is a lot that. of people, yeah, you have a ton of it. You have that in the paper every single day too. But the interesting thing about that is it's people think it's a double standard. But now the women are starting to go to prison. But that's the hardest case to prosecute because a lot of men, I hate to say it and I hate to go down the gender <laughs> lines, a lot of men say, why didn't I have that teacher? That didn't go on. Right. You know, it's almost like a rite of passage. It's almost cool to have sex with the female teacher. What people don't realize is what is a scathing and scarring effect it could have on a young boy. I had a, a, a young boy that tried to commit suicide when the female teacher broke up with him. She was older. He was a lot younger. He wasn't mature enough to handle a relationship. And she had basically taken him away from all his friends, you know, done all these things to try to get him. You remember that high profile one, Deborah LaFay? That blonde girl, teacher? Sure. I, I, I tried the first female teacher in the country. I just went to trial. Oh, really? It. And it, yeah. Oh, really? And it, because Mary Kay Turner was really the first one that came to light, but she pled. My case went to trial. And I can't begin to tell you how difficult it was for me to get a jury because many, many men on that jury panel said, I don't know if I would convict. I don't know if I would convict. Wow. I don't see what's so bad with an older woman having sex with a student. It's the biggest breach of trust that you can imagine. Parents send their kids to school to learn. They didn't teach them to learn. It doesn't you know, matter. It's not it's an extracurricular crime. activity to have sex with the, with the teacher. But it's almost becoming like an elective now because I don't know if these teachers are so immature or just think that nothing's ever going to happen to them, but we see so much of it now. Every 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 week in my office, there's an arrest involving a teacher or a coach, something like that. More and more, and uh, thank God there's people like you putting them to uh, to prison. I want to thank you for coming on. I uh, hope you have a happy Hanukkah. Uh, you have uh, some fans in the chat room. Sunset for Life says hello to you uh, via the chat room and says you do a great job. So, uh, uh Again, happy uh, Hanukkah. I believe you celebrate that. I celebrate Hanukkah. And Thank you. And I, I wish you a happy, happy holiday. And thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to come on. And um, I'll come back on when the next round of big cases come into the... Okay. Get those books, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to Stacey Hanowitz. Thank you, Stacey. I'll talk to you. Thanks, Jordan. Take care. Okay. Be well. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Stacey Hanowitz. Uh, great prosecutor, um, great show. She tells it like it is. Uh, I want to remind you that you can hear the show on replay right after uh, we go off the air. Just uh, restart it, and you'll hear the whole thing from the beginning, if you like. Follow the show on Twitter, at Mr. King Jordan. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash King Jordan Radio. Um, next week, uh, besides Tuesday, 8 p.m. here for wrestling, but we're going to do the best of the year with all the cases with Oscar Pistorius, Michael Brown, Michael Dunn, you name it. We will cover it next week right here on King Jordan Radio. Thank you to everybody, and uh, we will speak to you. Uh, we will speak to you uh, soon. Uh, let me leave you with uh, one of Bill Cosby's accusers. Good evening, everybody. So you said that he drugged, 
and assaulted you. You said multiple times. Yes. Right. You were a teenage. Mm -hmm. You were teen, a teenager, an yes. aspiring actress. What do you believe happened? Well, there were several occasions that I would. I woke up uh, out of a very confused state, um, not in my clothes. There was an occasion at his brownstone in New York City where I had gone for dinner and um, had one glass of wine with dinner. There were staffers there. The house was mingling with people. And before I knew it, I was with my head over the toilet, throwing up, and he was holding my hair out of my face. While I threw up, and I was in a white T-shirt and my panties, and he was looming over me in a white robe. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so you were at his house at a dinner party, or were you there to be with him? I was there alone, mm -hmm. and he had been mentoring me and grooming me. Mm -hmm. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and when I was 17, my agent introduced me to him mm -hmm. to groom me, to mentor me, to get me ready for show business, and part of that was bringing me to New York City. Did he ever make advances towards you when you weren't, because you believed that you were drugged, when you weren't drugged, did he make advances towards you? It was a very um, controlling and manipulative environment. It was very, um, very controlled, very isolated, and uh, there. Well, if you, if well, first of all, uh, a lot of uh, Northerners and Yankees may not even know what a switch is. This is a switch. Uh, I brought this to show uh, when uh, if you're not just black kids, white kids know what a switch is. Your grandma tells you, you go get me a switch, and you pull this twig off of a tree and they hit you in the legs with it and whether it's right or wrong I think people need to understand this is a part of southern culture if you look at the polling data a majority of all Americans a majority of white Americans agree with corporal punishment a majority of southerners agree uh, Midwesterners too this is something that, that goes on Midwest, uh, on the cosmopolitan coasts this is shocking to people but there's paddling there's whipping with belts there's uh, switching with switches uh, they're spanking, and this, and this is something that we need to have a debate about. I would say to anybody, because I was, I was corporally punished, kids today, you don't have to do that. Just take their iPod from them. <laughs> take their iPad. That's enough. You don't have to do but, all but, that stuff anymore. Right. But, but you need to understand this is something that is a, that is, is a major uh, a part of especially Southern culture, and to say that this guy yeah. is completely a complete lunatic, he took it too far, but it does happen. Okay, Dr. Taylor, go ahead. I, it, but this is a mistake also to characterize it as a black issue. The reality is spanking is an ineffective way to discipline children. And what happens is, yes, you may create fear, but if you keep spanking them, you will always create a lack, also create a lack of respect. And when you have a teenager who does not fear you nor respect you as they grow up, then you have a problem. Dr. Taylor, everything you're saying makes sense, except that there are statistics, as Van was just saying, that 80% of preschool children in this country, 80% have been spanked. So not all of them are growing up to be aggressive or to have mood disorders or any of the things that we've heard come from spanking. Uh, but uh, but uh, spanking in and of itself is ineffective as discipline. But we're not talking, we're, we're talking about abuse that leads to mood disorders and being more aggressive. And, and some parents do not know the difference between picking up an object to discipline or spank your child versus a, a firm pat or removing their hand. When you pick up objects, that's abuse. When you intend and, and, and want to inflict harm or pain to teach your child, that is abuse. Very quickly, Judge, do you think that there is a cultural divide here, north, south, black, white, I think there. I think that it's generational, Allison. I think people do what they have learned. I think they do That's what true. they have learned. I don't think it's necessary. I know white families who have been in my courtroom. I know rich families. I know poor families. My point is, yeah. I think it's whatever you have been taught right. is what you continue to do. Great point. But let me say this. Yep. The it's numbers very show, important. The, the, let, me just, let me just point out that the, okay. the polling data is very, is very clear that the majority of all racial groups in this country believe in corporal punishment. African Americans are about five to six points higher. But, so it's not just a black issue, it's an I American agree. issue, we need to deal with it that way. And that's exactly, and that was exactly the point I wanted to make. But let me just say, and I think that Doc, who I love and, and know, I think that this is a teachable moment. And I am sorry that this has come to this, but I think it's a teachable moment in this and nation that we've got to have this conversation. And you can't discipline a child when you're angry. Mm. I've said that to thousands of parents. Do not discipline when you're angry. All right. Every